Hello, everyone. Welcome to the All About Brewing Owls webinar. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I am just overjoyed with the amount of people that have joined us tonight. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, my name is Caitlin Burrows and I am a Habitat Stewardship Coordinator with Nature Saskatchewan and I'll be your MC for the evening. And I'm very excited to be here with all of you tonight and to get into everything burrowing owls. First, I'd like to start by stating that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life that they sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Okay, so we have an excellent evening planned for you. Our guest speakers tonight are joining, are joining us from across Western Canada. You'll hear from Lori Johnson with the Saskatchewan Burr and Owl Interpretive Center, Alexandra Fraze from the Manitoba, Manitoba Burr and Owl Recovery Program, Graham Dixon McCallum from the Calgary Zoo, Lauren Meads from the Burr and Owl Conservation Society of BC, and myself, Caitlin Burroughs with Nature Saskatchewan. All right, so I'll kick things off and I'm just gonna give a really brief overview of Nature Saskatchewan as an organization and a little bit about um, our overall habitat stewardship program. So Nature Saskatchewan was founded in 1949 and is a non-government charitable organization. We are member-based with close to 600 members and 16 local nature societies that we are affiliated with. We are Saskatchewan's largest volunteer-driven nonprofit naturalist organization, and we pride ourselves on being a voice for nature in Saskatchewan. Nature Saskatchewan's vision is humanity in harmony with nature, and our mission is to engage and inspire people to appreciate, learn about, and protect Saskatchewan's natural environment. While Nature Saskatchewan has many different types of programming, um, tonight I'm just going to specifically focus on the Stewards of Saskatchewan programs. And these programs are aimed at conserving prairie habitat for all prairie species, but focuses on their respective target species. The individual programs all have their slight differences based on their target species, but they were all modeled after the oldest and largest stewardship program, Operation Burrowing Owl, which I will be discussing in a little bit more detail later on this evening. All in all, these programs aim to conserve habitat and more specifically to engage landowners and the general public to get involved. By utilizing ambassador species, such as the Burrowing Owl, it also allows the programs to work towards the overall goal of prairie conservation and maintaining biodiversity throughout Saskatchewan. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and I will call on uh, Lori Johnson with the uh, Saskatchewan Burrowing Owl Interpretive Center to um, show her video. You can unmute yourself and you can take it away. Good evening, everybody. So I want to thank the Saskatchewan uh, Nature Saskatchewan team for inviting us uh, out to uh, participate in tonight's discussion. And for everybody who's joining us, thank you. Um, this is Peanut. He is one of our ambassador owls here at the center, and he's going to be joining us for throughout um, my brief talk. Um, you'll have to excuse his behavior. He uh, He's a little out of practice since we haven't been doing many programs lately. So I'm hoping he will behave, um, but we'll see. So the Saskatchewan Burrowing Owl Interpretive Center first started as a collaboration between um, several different nature organizations here in Saskatchewan. And Nature Saskatchewan was the primary focus. Um, also the Musha Exhibition Company and CIRM or the Saskatchewan Environmental Resource Management Program. And um, we came about as a partnership um, to promote the conservation of the burrowing owls here in Saskatchewan, as well as their prairie habitat. So it is the center's mandate to promote the conservation of the endangered burrowing owls and their prairie habitat through education, ecotourism, and stewardship. And we do that um, here at the center through in-house tours, as well as an outreach program known as Owls on Tour. 
And Peanut is just one of three uh, ambassador owls that we have hand raised to take part in our educational programming. He allows people to um, see one of Canada's most endangered bird species up close and personal. And as you can see, they are amazing little birds. Um, there are a few characteristics of the burrowing owls that set them apart from any other owl species that we have here in Canada. And probably the most interesting is the fact that they are the only are the only birds to nest under are the only owls, excuse me, to nest underground. And that's how they came by their name, burrowing owls. Although they utilize burrows, these guys don't actually do a lot of their own digging here um, on the Canadian prairies. Instead, they have a relationship with other types of fossorial mammals, such as prairie dogs, ground squirrels, and badgers. And these guys will move in and take over burrows that have been abandoned by those other, other animals. Another characteristic that kind of sets them apart from other owl species is the fact that they're actually a diurnal owl. And that just means that these guys are more active during the daylight hours than um, um, a typical nocturnal owl would be. So they are um, busy hunting throughout the day, um, although they focus their majority of the hunting um, during dawn and dusk hours. So they are classified as a crepuscular hunter. Now, because they are active throughout the day, that actually opens up their diet to some slightly different uh, prey items than what we would normally uh, visualize an owl utilizing. These guys easy, buddy, will actually uh, use a lot or utilize a lot of insects as a basis to their diet. So grasshoppers, crickets, beetles are a large part of their diet, as well as small, in, uh, small reptiles, amphibians, rodents, and birds. So um, the, these guys are also um, a migratory species here in Canada, which does set them apart as well. So we only see burrowing owls for a breeding season here in the southern parts of Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and the interior of BC. So we will typically see them returning from their wintering grounds in southern Texas and central Mexico in late April and early May. And once they return, they're pretty, usually pretty quick to pair up uh, and begin um, raising a new generation of burrowing owls. Now, burrowing owls are a, a not a monogamous species, so they typically will find a new mate every year. Um, and their courtship is, is, um, is rather short and to the point. Um, the males will often call for the females to, to um, gather their attention. And one of the neat things about some of their courtship rituals is that um, male burrowing owls will often cache away extra food items down in the burrow um, to prove to the females that they are actually very good are good providers. Um, so the males with the best burrow location and the best pantry are often the ones to uh, attract a mate. So uh, once they have paired up, they usually, the female will usually begin laying eggs rather quickly. And typically a clutch of eggs consists of anywhere between five and 12 eggs. Typically eight or nine is a good average size. And the female will actually incubate them for about 29 days prior to them beginning to hatch. And burrowing owl eggs will actually hatch in the order that they were laid. So you can see an age difference um, in the chicks once they begin to emerge from, from the burrow in about two weeks time. So during the incubation period, the female um, spends the majority of her time down, on the bur down in the burrow and it's the male's responsibility to protect the burrow, protect his mate and bring back food to her. <clears throat> Now, um, when the burrowing owl chicks or owlets hatch, they are completely dependent upon their parents for food, warmth, and protection. They're actually hatched out of their eggs with their eyes closed and their eyes don't begin to open until they are about two weeks old, or excuse me, seven days old. And at, at about two weeks, the youngsters are old enough um, and strong enough that they start venturing out of the burrow. And at that time, um, mom can start spending more time away uh, from, from the burrow and hunting as well. <clears throat> Burrowing owl chicks do mature quite quickly. By the time they're about eight weeks old, 
Um, they have reached almost adult height and weight, and they are completely um, independent of their parents. So they're flying and hunting on their own. However, most of the time they will stay in close contact with their parents um, until everybody's ready to migrate in the fall. So they'll often use satellite burrows um, not too far away from the original nest. So some of the main reasons why um, our, our burrowing owl population here in Canada has declined over the years has to do with the fact that they've lost nearly 50% of their historical range. So a lot of the land that they were utilizing um, has been um, changed or augmented in some way that um, means that it no longer supports the burrowing owls um, for a, a natural, in their natural um, type of behaviors. So loss and fragmentation of their habitat is one of the main reasons why the burrowing owls are an endangered species here in Canada. But along with that, you get some compounding factors as well, such as the use of pesticides, which can affect the burrowing owls um, in two different ways. One, it um, decreases a readily available food source in those insects that they like to utilize. And secondly, as a secondary poisoning when they um, accidentally ingest the poison um, off the insects. Another big one that affects their numbers here in, in Canada is the loss of other burrowing mammals. Uh, if you remember from earlier, the burrowing owls here don't do much of their own burrow digging. So they're um, relying on other types of animals to do that for them. And unfortunately, the big three burrows that they utilize are prairie dog, badger, and ground squirrels. And those species have been persecuted here by farmers and ranchers for, for many years. And because of that, their populations have declined. So without suitable burrowing mammals, there are no suitable burrows for the owls to utilize. And then, um, the first year of life is very difficult for young burrowing owls, and we tend to see um, a lot of mortality in the young owls just due to some of their interactions with the natural world around them. Um, a lot of young burrowing owls um, will actually meet their fate um, with vehicle collisions in, um, uh, you know, around rural roadsides and stuff like that. So uh, human interaction is another reason why the burrowing owls are an endangered species. So some of the things that we can do to help preserve and conserve our burrowing owls here um, on the prairies is to support wildlife conservation and educational programs and organizations like the ones here tonight, um, as well as learning about some of our native uh, species. Um, we, can only, we can only save what we understand um, and care about. So by learning about the burrowing owls and sharing your knowledge, you can actually end up doing a lot for them. And just, um, of course, being conscious of our impact on the, on the environment and the other living creatures in our, in our lives. So I think that kind of concludes my talk um, for the evening. Awesome. Thank you, Lori and Peanut. Can we, can you lift him up a little bit? I know he's a little cranky tonight. Let's see his face. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Awesome. Okay, so we got, we have a couple minutes here for any questions. So Ashley, if you've got some questions for us or for Lori, please go yes. ahead. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Yes, we do have some questions. Hi, Peanut. Peanut, feel free to answer these questions if you know the answers. <laughs> um, so great presentation, Lori. Um, the first question is, I live in the Lucky Lake, Sask area. Uh, that's between Elbow and Beachy, just north of um, the South Sask River. And the question is, are there burrowing owls in my immediate area? You know, that's probably a question better uh, presented to actually one of the nature Saskatchewan team members. <laughs> they deal with a lot of uh, owners in various areas around the province. Um, so I don't know of any particular um, burrows in that area, but that's not to say that there isn't any there. Yeah, it, it's definitely within the range. So there would be, you know, burrowing owls are very rare. Like Lori said, they've had that big decline. So it's hard to find one, you know, really anywhere, even if they are around, but um, their range definitely covers that area. So they, 
uh, you know, hopefully you might get one somewhere if you drive around and take a look at the fence posts. Um, so another question for you, Lori. Um, with the recent storm in Texas, do you think this will risk their return to Canada this year? It's always a, a possibility, and um, a lot of migratory birds are can be you know deeply affected by. Uh, those wicked weather changes. So um, we always hope that they've managed to, you know, um, survive the, the storms and weather and other obstacles that are in their path during uh, migrations, but it's always a big possibility, yes. We're getting a bunch of questions coming up. So I'll just ask some quick ones. How old is he? <laughs> he is going to be five years old. Five, oh boy. Um, will burrowing owls use artificial burrows? They will. Um, that's actually um, what we use here at the center, both in their outdoor enclosures and indoor enclosures. And they quite readily adapt to, to the um, artificial burrows. In the wild, they've been known to use, um, you know, drainage pipes, culverts, um, deep cracks in the wall that, you know, will lead that back into a wall um, as nesting sites as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a natural burrow dug out by, you know, a badger or anything like that. Okay, um, thank you. The questions are just pouring in. People are very interested. Oh, here comes Caitlin. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I feel like we could be here for hours and hours, but uh, to keep things on pace here, we'll have to move on. But um, not to worry everyone with your questions. Um, as I said, anything that we didn't have time to get to, which I have a feeling is going to be a lot, um, we'll make sure to get those questions answered and, and get that out to everybody. So um, thank you, Lori, so much, and Peanut for coming by. And um, yeah, we really, we're really happy you could make it tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us out, and enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you, Lori. Bye. Okay, so now it's my turn. So I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. So hopefully everyone can see that okay. Okay, so um, now I'm going to um, discuss, um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Nature Saskatchewan stewardship program called um, Operation Burrowing Owl. Um, I may abbreviate a couple times. Um, we call Operation Burrowing Owl OBO. Um, so you may hear that a few times throughout, but just so you're aware. So, um, as I mentioned, all of Nature Saskatchewan's stewardship programs, including uh, Operation Burrowing Owl or OBO, have four main goals. Um, they are habitat stewardship, site identification and population monitoring, habitat enhancement, and education and awareness. With our habitat stewardship, our objective here is to conserve habitat for the burrowing owl and other native prairie species through voluntary stewardship agreements and informed land stewardship. Participants sign a voluntary uh, handshake agreement that we like to call it, in which they agree to, to conserve the nesting areas and the habitat for current or past records of owls. Um, they agree to not alter the nest site or unduly disturb the species. They also agree to annually report the number of owls or absence of owls on their land. The agreement is non-binding and can be canceled at any time, uh, making this commitment attractive to, to many landowners. Um, for example, currently we have 344 participants that are conserving just over 160,000 acres of habitat across Southern and Central Saskatchewan. Stewardship recognition um, is very important. Uh, landowners are the heart and soul of the program. And since 1987, um, we've been giving landowners the option of receiving a free gate sign. And they really have become a symbol for conservation in Southern and Central Saskatchewan and many people have seen them and are familiar with them. And maybe there's some people that are um, on our webinar tonight that have seen them. Um, we also hold uh, two to three conservation awareness and appreciation events throughout Southern and, and Central Saskatchewan every year as an expression of our thanks and appreciation to our participants. It includes a catered supper and educational presentations. Uh, we also try to visit as many landowners as possible each year. These landowner visits are really a vital component of the program and it serves many purposes. 
The face-to-face -face landowner visits are a great way of creating that initial relationship and is really important for maintaining that relationship for years to come. We also visit landowners to provide them with species information as well as species at risk beneficial management practice plans. Uh, there are beneficial management practices that can be recommended to landowners to help them decide which actions are appropriate for their operation to meet their management goals and also provide benefits to species at risk. One of the most important activities um, is the annual population monitoring. So our objective here is to monitor burying owl population and distribution changes through an annual census at enrolled uh, operation burying owl sites. And this helps, or this provides an evaluation of the success of conservation actions in maintaining and possibly increasing population numbers. This is extremely important from perspective because there are no other existing widespread approaches for monitoring Saskatchewan burying owl populations. OBO has been monitoring um, burying owl populations uh, through an annual census since 1987. Um, so we mail a census card to all participants every June and participants report the number of owl pairs or single scene, any changes in land use and any interest in conservation activities such as conservation easements or cropland conversions. Uh, with landowner permission, uh, the species occurrence information is given to the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center, as well as the Burying Owl Recovery Team Lead. And the Conservation Data Center houses all species occurrence information for the province, and it allows us to monitor species populations um, across the province. And no personal information is ever shared. So um, here's a graph that's um, showing burying owl population trend on Operation Burring Owl sites. Um, so the red line on the graph um, shows the dramatic decline in the burying owl population um, until about 1994, after which the decline rate is less and um, levels off with slight increases and, and decreases over the years. Um, the black line is the number of participating landowners, and this has remained fairly steady. Um, with slight de decrease in the past few years, but we're always working to maintain and even better increase our number of participating landowners. So our most recent census results are for uh, 2019 and uh, Operation Burying Owl landowners reported just 16 pairs, eight singles and four young. Um, so the most recent estimate that's been put out by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada or COSIWIC states that as of 2015, there were approximately 100 owls in Saskatchewan. So it's, they're pretty low. Our, our habitat enhancement goal um, is to increase and improve habitat for burying owls. The habitat enhancement projects include native seeding, wildlife friendly fencing, and alternative water development. Native seeding is done in order to convert cropland to pasture, to enlarge pastures and as well as to reduce habitat fragmentation. Wildlife friendly fencing um, is supported in order to preserve newly seeded areas as well as to improve pasture health. And what wildlife friendly fencing means is there's a smooth top and bottom wire and two barbed wires in the middle uh, with some height restrictions. And this is done to help other wildlife jump over or crawl under the fence with ease. Alternative water development um, is supported, supported such as solar pumps, um, and this is done to improve pasture health. Projects are done on a 50% cost share basis, um, and participants sign a 12-year contract uh, to ensure long-term benefits of these projects. So overall, Nature Saskatchewan has funded 126 projects for burrowing owls. Over 15,000 acres of cropland has been seeded back to perennial grass. 110 kilometers of wildlife friendly fencing has been erected and 16 water developments have been completed. Uh, sites are monitored for burying owl, burring owl use every year as well. Um, so for example, in 2019, we had four pairs and one single and two young reported found nesting on or near enhanced sites. So it's pretty high um, percentage of the pairs found, which is great. Uh, lastly, with our education and awareness objective, we provide information and increase awareness to landowners and members of the public about burying owls and the importance of conserving prairie habitat and species diversity. We do two mailouts a year with our participants to keep them involved. Uh, we do a spring mailout, which includes the census card that I had uh, talked about earlier. 
a spring update on our programs and our plans for the summer. And we may also include any new outreach material we have. Uh, the fall mail out includes our annual newsletter, which keeps our participants informed about species at risk, our programs, as well as other research and events that's going, that's going on in the province or, at, or internationally, um, as well as our very popular species at risk calendar. We also do uh, many other outreach activities, uh, such as news releases, advertisements, articles, TV and radio interviews, giving presentations and attending events, all to increase awareness and encourage people to report burring owl and other species at risk sightings. So I have to give a plug to the, the stewards in our programs because they really are the backbone of everything that we, that we do and the reason we've been able to continue for so many years. They are the ones that are managing and caring for both the habitat and the species. And it's because of their care that many of the species at risk that we deal with still have habitat. So you may be wondering, what can you do? Well, reporting owl sightings is so critically important. It helps us monitor their population and distribution and allows for a much better understanding of how many burrowing owls are actually out there. If you're able, uh, you can consider donating your time or your money. Knowledge is power and it's very powerful. So learning about burrowing owls and telling others just like you're doing this evening is a great way to contribute. You can conserve existing habitat and other wildlife and this in turn will help conserve overall biodiversity. You can join a naturalist organization, Life Nature Saskatchewan, and lastly, you can write letters to government and encourage species at risk and habitat conservation and support of conservation organizations like Nature Saskatchewan. So once again, if you spot a burrowing owl, call us to report it. Even right now, I'm sure you've got your phone by you. Take a couple seconds and save the phone number in your phone. It's really easy. It's 1-800-667-HOOT. So if you spot or think you've spotted a burrowing owl or any species at risk, give us a call. You can call our toll-free hoot line and your call will help to determine the abundance and distribution of burrowing owls as well as other species at risk in Saskatchewan. And caller information is kept completely confidential and personal information is never shared without permission. And this includes the person reporting the sighting as well as the landowner where the species was seen. Okay, so that's it for me. So thank you very much. Um, I will stop here and we've got a couple minutes here for questions. Okay, great presentation, Caitlin. Um, I've, so yeah, the questions are still pouring in. Thanks everybody. I'm gonna try and lump some together. Uh, so I have a question about burrows, a uh, couple questions. So okay. how do they actually burrow? Do they use their feet? And also, is it true they cover their burrows with poop and why? Okay, so um, burrowing owls actually don't dig their own burrows. Um, they may use their feet to, you know, maybe pick something out of the way or, you know, make something a little bit nicer for them. But all in all, they're, they're, they can't dig their own burrows. So um, what's really important um, is other uh, mammals like badgers, uh, gophers, Richardson's ground squirrels is what they're actually called, or gophers. Those mammals are really important um, for burrowing owls because they rely on those burrows that they dig um, to nest in. And the second, oh, sorry, Ashley. Oh, go ahead. Okay, the second part of the question is, yes, it is true. They do use manure to line um, their burrows. And the reasons that they do that is, it's thought to that it covers the scent of the owls. So any predators that might be nearby as well as it attracts insects, which is a huge part of their diet. Awesome, so here's a fun one. Caitlin, given your surname, did you have much choice in a career path? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little, someone made a joke, which I love. Yeah, yeah, no, um, I, I am qualified for my job. <laughs> I will say that. Um, I'm sure there's someone who's better qualified, but it just happened to work out that, uh, yes, my last name is Burroughs, and I run a burrowing owl program. It's true. And I've got a couple other sort of grouped questions. So um, some people are asking about strategies to photograph burrowing owls or how do, how do we see burrowing owls? Are they on fence posts or just where can you find burrowing owls? Yeah, okay, that's, that's a great question. Um, I would say with 
a little bit of luck on your side, um, but as well as, um, you know, driving down the grid roads is a great way to spot burrowing owls. Um, they will nest in ditches, in pastures, edges of cropland, things like that. And watching those fence posts is a really great way to, to potentially spot a burrowing owl. Um, I will caution, drive those roads slowly because the owls do like to hang around on the grid roads. So just make sure you're watching, but that that's a potential way to maybe see one. Right on. Um, okay, so another question is, uh, you mentioned badgers. Um, are, in, are badgers endangered or at risk? And also, do you see similar population trends in other animals like badgers or prairie dogs that dig the burrows that the burrowing owls require? Yeah, so the, the, a badger is a listed species. It is listed as special concern, I believe. Um, and am I seeing similar trends to the burrowing owl? That's the question. Yeah, it was a separate question, but kind of about the badgers mm -hmm. and prairie dogs as well, if they're declining. Yes, so they are declining. Um, they, and it very likely is a correlation there because burrowing owls rely so much on these mammals. If we're seeing a decrease in these mammals that dig the burrows, we could see a decrease in the burrowing owls as well. It's just one of the many factors that are against the burrowing owls, unfortunately. Very good. Um, so I'll just ask one more question. Okay. Um, so could you tell us some things that are needed to make habitat to encourage burrowing owls into an area? Sure. So one really great way, if you if you have um, if you're if you have existing habitat and um, you have cropland that you can seed back to pasture. Um, that's a really great way to encourage burrowing owls. Um, if, you're, if, if you're more tolerant of having those burrowing mammals around the, that I mentioned, the gophers and the badgers, um, as well as potentially reducing your use of insecticide as insects are a huge part of their diet. So those are some little things that could be done um, that could potentially help attract some owls. Okay, thanks very much. We have a ton more questions, but we'll have to answer them through email afterwards. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, great. All right, so um, next up, we have Alexandra Fraze with the Manitoba Burring Owl Recovery Program. So Alex, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your screen. There she is. And take it away when you're ready. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. I'm really excited to talk to everybody about the work I've been doing in southwestern Manitoba for the last 11 years with burrowing owls. Um, and yeah, it's exciting to meet up again with uh, Lauren and Graham and Lori and Caitlin um, in this type of format just to talk about what's been going on with burrowing owls in the last year as we haven't been able to get together for any meetings. So this is really great. So um, I'm the executive director of the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program. My name's Alex Fraze, and I've been working with burrowing owls for 11 years. I'm gonna get right to it here. So Lori mentioned already that the burrowing owl is listed as endangered in Canada, uh, across Western Canada. There have been major declines in Manitoba uh, and in British Columbia. So in British Columbia, they're actually listed as extirpated. Lauren will speak more to their program out there and what they're doing for burrowing owls. But in Manitoba, they've been teetering on extirpation for quite some time. But um, we've had major declines in uh, since the 1980s. So in 1978, there were about 78 pairs that were recorded. And then into the 1980s, um, there were further declines. And in 1996, there was only one known pair in Manitoba. Thereafter, 2000 to 2005, there were zero reports by landowners and um, no observations by biologists or birders. So it was looking pretty, pretty bleak for the burrowing owl in 2005, but not all hope was lost. Uh, in 2006 through 2009, there were 35 pairs and 13 individuals that were reported or observed by biologists or birders. 
And of these 35 pairs, um, these pairs had large family groups, which was great, like a burrowing owl um, nest can consist, of a, consist of approximately 12 to 13 eggs in a clutch. And a lot of these pairs were um, popping up with young that out of their nests with seven or eight young during those, during those years. So it was very exciting. So that was the good, uh, best, the best time for me to start a master's project. So in 2010 through 2012, I did three field seasons out in southwestern Manitoba. So the burrowing owl, uh, the range used to extend all the way to Winnipeg. So when I mentioned 1978, where we had about 78 pairs, uh, that was when the range had extended all the way to Winnipeg here in Manitoba. But now the range has contracted uh, dramatically and we generally only find breeding wild owls in the extreme southwest corner of the province. So very near the United States border and very near the Saskatchewan border. So what did my study look at? Uh, I looked at most breeding biology aspects of captive release and wild burrowing owls. I looked at nesting, hatching, fledging, post-fledging mortality and dispersal. So when are the owls leaving uh, in the season? So if they left the the release site or their nesting site, what, what were the days that they were leaving? And I was comparing that to both groups. I looked at prey use. So are captive owls able to um, collect the same type of food that uh, wild owls are collecting? And how I figured that out was I uh, was able to dissect pellets. So you get to learn a lot of interesting things by looking through pellets that these owls are spitting up. Um, and then I also looked at home range for wild and captive release males. Uh, so I think Flory had mentioned that the males are more uh, are generally the provider. So we um, we looked at uh, the stage right before young are emerging from the burrow. So from hatch to I I call it pre-emergence. So the baby burrowing owls stay down in their burrow until um, about 10 to 14 days old. So we attach these little GPS data loggers to the wild males and the captive release males to track where they were flying and where they were getting their food from. And this allowed us to assess emerging threats um, that were um, that are affecting burrowing owls in southwestern Manitoba. So after that uh, three year study, I hadn't uh, recovered the burrowing owl in Manitoba. I know that's shocking, right? Um, but all kidding aside, uh, there's been a lot of people that have been uh, at this work for many years and there's such a cocktail of um, struggles for burrowing owls, like Lori mentioned as well. Um, there's migration, pesticide use, loss of habitat, loss of uh, burrowing mammals. So all of these things are creating um, issues uh, for survival for burrowing owls on the breeding grounds and on the wintering grounds. So in 2013, after I finished my study, we established the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program. And I work with a few project partners, one being the Assiniboine Park Zoo here in Winnipeg. And then the other is the Souris River Watershed District. And we are trying to recover the burrowing owl through a few activities. One is reintroductions, also research. What can we learn from the owls to better understand emerging threats? We're conducting surveys and we're monitoring any wild nests and our captive uh, release owl nests and education. So we're doing things like tonight. We're talking to people about um, why burrowing owls are important. And then we are working one-on-one -on -one with landowners to improve habitat. So to give you an idea of where our reintroduction sites are, I'd mentioned very close to the Saskatchewan border and very close to uh, the US border here. So this yellow, dot is where you can find our study sites or our release sites. And just to familiarize yourself with southwestern Manitoba, um, if any of you have traveled out this way, here's Brandon. Um, and that's on the highway, highway one, if you're taking that across western Canada to Ontario. And our uh, release sites are all further south. Uh, right here is the town of Melita. And that's where I live for four months of the, uh, in the summer. And our release sites are all around um, Melita, Deloraine, Medora, Lyleton, and Broomhill. And this is an example of our soft release caging. 
So our soft release cages um, look a little different across Canada. I'm sure Graham and Lauren will also touch um, or show some photos of their soft release caging as well. Ours are made of two by fours, um, some construction fencing on the top there. It's got chicken wire and some bird uh, netting on the inside. Each uh, soft release cage is um, equipped with a artificial nest burrow. And an artificial nest burrow uh, for our captive release owls, we use a three bucket system. So this allows us access outside of the uh, outside of the pen. So we're not having to go in and out of the pen all the time and disturb the owls. So the top bucket just pulls up and that's at ground level. And then we're able to see into the bottom bucket if uh, the owls have nested, um, if young have hatched, et cetera. And here's some uh, photos right from the field. So that bottom bucket um, here is a 15 gallon bucket. Uh, that other uh, photo didn't really show that. We used to use five gallon buckets for all three, but now we've made the uh, bottom bucket a 15 gallon. And then we have uh, the three bucket or the two buckets on top of that 15 gallon, which are the five bucket, um, five buckets or sorry, five gallon size. And then we use, uh, I think Lauren calls this big O out in BC, but we uh, call it weeping tile here in Manitoba. So it's a six inch weeping tile, it's perforated. And we use a section about uh, 10 feet of this that attaches to this 15 gallon bucket. And then uh, that acts as the burrow and then it goes up to ground level. So we take um, weights, uh, blood sample, wing cord, uh, tail length um, and molt. We record all of these details for every owl that we have in hand. So if they're wild or captive release, um, all of our owls are banded. So our captive release owls have a alphanumeric color coded band that's uh, specific to Manitoba. And our wild owls also have that as well. So we have a red blue band for captive release owls and then a black band for wild owls. And it has a tiny little line in the middle because I believe BC uses black as well, but they, we have a line and they don't so that we're able to uh, differentiate between the populations of owls if anybody's seeing them show up on the wintering grounds or back on the breeding grounds. So for our surveys, we uh, were driving around. Uh, Caitlin had mentioned uh, driving around the like, grid roads. Um, so we're driving around roads in southwestern Manitoba. Um, a lot are uh, not very well traveled roads and we're trying to locate wild burrowing owls and we're looking for suitable habitat. So our roadside surveys are completed at dawn and dusk. Lori had mentioned um, that burrowing owls are most active at those times. So that's why we do it at those times. And we're looking for grassland, pastureland, um, available burrows or populations of ground squirrels. And all of these um, surveys are done by the roadside, but we do contact landowners with suitable habitat um, or if we find a wild owl, we will um, contact the landowner. We, we get some help with contact information from the Sewer River Watershed District. And I'll talk a little bit about that on another slide coming up here. We do use a playback call of the male territorial call. If you're here right at the start, Caitlin, or perhaps it was Rebecca or Ashley were playing the cuckoo call of the male burrowing owl. So we use that call to attract both wild and female, or sorry, wild male and female burrowing owls to fly up to a higher spot that we might see them from the roadside or up to a, like a spot like a fence post that's been mentioned too, but they do like to sit on fence posts a lot. So just to give you an idea of some of the areas that are suitable and uh, not suitable that we, we have surveyed in southwestern Manitoba and where we found wild owls. So anything that's a green blob is suitable habitat. So that would be anything that ha is pasture land, open, uh, it has populations of ground squirrels. We can see that there's open and visible burrows. Um, we also highlight anything here with yellow that's potentially suitable. So it's missing one of those other requirements that we would we deem land to be suitable. So it may not have visible burrows, but everything else is there that I've listed. Anything red is areas that are not suitable. So these would be areas that are low lying and flooding that have, have shown some uh, issues with flooding or cropland. 
and blue dots are where we've found uh, wild owls in the last 11 years. So to give you an idea, I mentioned Melita, that's right by Highway 83 here. So we've got some wild owls here near Broom Hill, I mentioned that name, and then down here, here's Lyleton I mentioned, we have had some release sites there in the past. Um, we've got Goodlands over here, and then this is Whitewater Lake, if anybody's familiar with Southern Manitoba. Um, or southwestern Manitoba. And then we've got Souris to kind of give you an idea of where, where we are on, on a larger map. So Brandon is further north, and this is Highway 2 here. So I mentioned before that um, we a big part of our program is education. So we are traveling around, generally, we're traveling around uh, southern Manitoba uh, talking to people about burrowing owls. This year was very different, or last year, 2020 was very different. Uh, a lot of um, community events were closed uh, or, or canceled and uh, schools weren't allowing for people obviously to be in to do presentations. So we've taken a lot of that virtual, virtual now um, with presentations for community events and through schools. Um, we also work one-on-one -on -one with landowners um, what we generally do is we connect with landowners based on our survey um, survey information. So if we found locations that have wild owls or if they have really good suitable habitat or what we deem suitable habitat for burrowing owls, then we contact the Sewers River Watershed District and then they help us connect with the landowner. And then we try to meet up with them one-on-one. -on -one. We do, we call them generally first and then try to, try to um, make an appointment to see them. Uh, most of these people are very busy um, because they are uh, landowners and they're caring for their land and their animals on the land. So um, we make an appointment to uh, meet up with them and then we talk to them about their practices and then also some options uh, to uh, increase um, opportunities for burrowing owls to potentially return to their land by uh, installing artificial nest burrows. So I'll speed through this because Caitlin's here. I'm here, yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, I'm, I'm done here. So I just want to um, thank uh, everybody so much who's been a part of our program. So we have our main project partners, like I mentioned, uh, the Simone Park Zoo and then the Suris River Watershed District. But our program runs solely on private and public funding. So uh, a huge shout out to all the public funds that we've received and all the private donors um, and organizations that have supported our program for the last eight years and also through my study period as well. Okay, so awesome. this is just some information about our social media and ways that you can donate to our program if you're interested. And um, yeah, I'll conclude with that. Awesome, thank you, Alex, that was great. Do you have a little friend there with you? Just I do. So I can bring her out if you if please. Yeah. Yes, okay. please do. So, um, I have Coco. She's a seven and a half year old uh, female burrowing owl. And she is our education ambassador, one of our education ambassadors for our program. And she actually came to us through um, the Saskatchewan Burrowing Owl Interpretive Center. So she was hatched uh, and raised there by Lori. And she came to our program uh, when she's about six months old. So I'll get her. Awesome. Oh, that's great. We were really able to see how small they are when you kind of had her held back a little bit. Should I stop yeah. sharing my screen so that it'll be bigger? Sure, yes. Yeah, okay. That, yeah. okay. Perfect. So this is Coco. And like I said, she's seven and a half. And she came from the Saskatchewan Burrowing Owl Interpretive Center. She was hatched there with, uh, there's a a family of six. And then her and her brother Cricket were imprinted uh, for education. And then she came to Manitoba in December of 2013. So Wonderful. here this is me um, because of obviously the work I do and I travel around Manitoba talking to people about burrowing owls. Um, but yeah, she's a fantastic education owl. Um, I, I can't say 
it, she's just, you're so wonderful. Hey, Coco. Yeah, she's just, uh, she's met so many people. And I feel like uh, it goes so much further for people to actually see what they're trying to save, um, or why, like why you should be interested and just see how um, unique and special they are up close. So um, yeah, she's been, she's been a wonderful part of our program and we hope that we'll be able to get out again and see people live in person and travel around again. Hey, I Coco. hope so too. Yeah. Yeah. They still get me every time I see one and it just, <laughs> they're just incredible. Yeah. Um, so I think we got just a few minutes here just for uh, maybe one or two questions. So Ashley, do you um, have some questions here? Hi there. Yeah. I got, a, I got a couple of good ones. Um, so one question is, uh, how do burrowing owls do in actively grazed pastures with cattle? Can they coexist successfully in the same pasture? Yes, for sure. Um, I generally say that like beef, beef and burrowing owls go together because um, cattle keep the grass nice and short. And um, as long as there's burrows available or we, we can install burrows, um, if there aren't any available, it, it works out really well. Um, we work we, we've installed over 250 artificial nest burrows um, wow. on pasture land throughout the last 11 years and um, never have never had a complaint from uh, a landowner um, with any issues with them. And, and this year or this last year, I keep thinking it's still 2020. Um, in 2020, we had a wild pair of burrowing owls nest in artificial nest burrows. And we haven't had that happen since 2011. There weren't any wild pairs in Manitoba since 2011. So super exciting. They nested, they had six young, they all fledged. Um, so really wonderful to like work with this private landowner and we put in these burrows and the owls came. That's fantastic. I love yeah. those, you know, good news stories like that. Um, okay, and another question is, where do you get your nest supplies from? Do you have any partnerships that allow you to use recycled materials or repurposed materials? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so our materials have, um, so the netting I, I get from a local place here in Winnipeg. Um, everything else we've just purchased ourselves from Rona or Home Depot. Um, and uh, the, the watershed districts, they used to be two conservation districts. Um, so Turtle Mountain Conservation District uh, built a few of the, the pens for us, um, which was really nice. But yeah, I haven't used any recycle, recyclable um, materials yeah, yet, but that could be something. Okay, and uh, Caitlin's not back yet, so I'll sneak one more in. Okay. Is it possible to attach a tracking device to a burrowing owl? Yeah, so it is. Uh, I'm going to let Graham talk a bit more about that because uh, they're doing some great work there in Alberta, and they are using transmitters on some burrowing owls there. We have yet to do that here in Manitoba. They're, they are quite expensive, because, um, and they have to be um, this particular type of transmitter because they're light enough to put on a burrowing owl. But I'll let Graham speak a little bit more about that. Okay, sounds good. Awesome. Thank you. That's a great segue because <laughs> next is Graham. So awesome. So thank you, Alex. No thank problem. you so much for being here. That's great. All right. So Graham, you're up. Um, so we have Graham, Dixon, McCallum from the Calgary Zoo. Um, so please go ahead, unmute yourself and share your screen and take it away. Hello. And uh, yeah, thanks, Alex. That was a, indeed was an excellent segue. Um, just gonna share my screen here. Let's, let's, uh, let's do, let me show you that one instead of presenter view. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in to listen tonight. Um, I'm really excited that there's so many people interested in, in burrowing owls. I think myself, like many of us who, who work on these species, spend a lot of time thinking about these animals. And it's really always very exciting to see that a few hundred other people are really interested and excited to talk about them as well. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about uh, what we're doing in Alberta and, and at the Calgary Zoo um, and what we have been doing since we started our project in 2016. So we're sort of the, uh, the newcomer to the burrowing owl game across Western Canada, I guess you could say. Um, and we're doing this work in collaboration with the province of Alberta, Alberta Environment and Parks, uh, and the Canadian Wildlife Service. 
And I wanted to start my presentation about burrowing owls by showing you these pictures of turtles, uh, because I thought I should start by talking about just what is head starting and what am I talking about when I say that we're doing a burrowing owl head starting project in Calgary. Um, and really what we're doing in head starting, and it's a technique that you can use with many species uh, at risk, not just owls and not just burrowing owls, is you're helping animals through one short period of their life when they're might be a bunch of challenges and then getting them beyond that period in their life to when there are hopefully fewer challenges. So turtles are some animals that I'm showing you now because there are many head starting projects with turtles, including with Blanding's turtles. This photo is from the Toronto Zoo, but there's one near and dear to my heart, the project with Blanding's turtles in Nova Scotia, where I'm from, where you're keeping turtles in captivity until they're big enough that there are a lot fewer predators that can eat them. And so burrowing owls are also a really good uh, sort of species for trying something like head starting for a few of the reasons that, uh, you know, Lori and Caitlin and Alex uh, were all talking about and have been talking about already. Uh, first of all, we want to give owls a head start because, as everyone else has said, they're endangered in Canada and they're continuing to decline. So it's really good if we can do more to help them. Uh, as everyone else has also said, they have a lot of eggs uh, in a nest. On average, there's about six to nine, but as, as others have said, you know, we see nests occasionally with 12 or even 13 eggs in them. So there's many eggs in a nest. Um, and burrowing owls and some other birds as well uh, have this interesting uh, trait of their nesting biology called asynchronous hatching, which really just means that they hatch out of sort of, they don't all hatch at the same time. So the first egg laid or the first few eggs that are laid will hatch before eggs that are laid later. And each egg is hatching about a day and a half apart. Um, so you'd have a clutch of owls like this. And as they hatch out, you end up with a whole brood of owlets that are all about a day and a half apart in age. And that difference in age ends up creating a pretty big difference in size of the owls in the nest. So the two owls that you can see on the screen here, as it says, are just about five days apart in age, but you can see that the one on the right hand side is a lot bigger than the one on the left hand side. And because it's bigger, that means it's better suited to outcompete its younger siblings for food in the nest. So their parents bring them food, but there still ends up being competition between the owlets in the nest, which means that while burrowing owls generally are threatened, these little burrowing owls, they have a really, really tough time of it. And in fact, the vast, vast majority of these youngest last hatched burrowing owls don't survive to even leave the nest. And so for us, that's an opportunity because we can take those youngest owlets that have almost no chance of surviving in the wild and then bring them into captivity for a period of time when we can hopefully give them a head start and a boost and then return them back to the wild when they'll have hopefully a better chance of surviving. So that's uh, what we're doing in Calgary. So when in Alberta, so we take some of these youngest, smallest owls, we bring them to the zoo where we keep them over winter. So we're doing this trapping in June and July to capture owls in the wild. We're bringing them to the zoo, keeping them through fall and winter, and then releasing them the following spring uh, into artificial nest burrows that we build in very similar to, to the ones that Alex showed you pictures of. And of course, we're not just doing this with one owl at a time, we're doing it with quite a few owls. Uh, generally, more recently, we're trying to do 20 owls at a time per year. Uh, I should mention that currently we don't have any owls at the Calgary Zoo uh, because of the zoo was closed for a period in the summer. Uh, we had to scale back a bit, but we will be restarting the project in the future. So when we have all these owls at the zoo, we can care for them over the winter while the rest of burrowing owls from Canada have left and migrated south. And then in the springtime, as owls are coming back to the breeding grounds in Alberta, we then release the owls that we've had in male-female pairs. Um, as Alex mentioned, we all uh, use slightly different uh, enclosures or called soft release enclosures. So we build an enclosure like this that we put over the entrance to an artificial burrow and we leave it there for the first two weeks after release um, while the new pair of owls kind of get to know each other and get to kind of look out and see the lay of the land. Um, and by leaving this enclosure and keeping the owls together for the first two weeks, it really, really increases the chances that these owls will actually nest and will actually stay there. Um, and so really, in, in order to do this, uh, we do a lot of similar things that Alex uh, was talking about. We do surveys throughout southeastern Alberta. We find burrowing owl nests and monitor those nests to find out when they're laying eggs, when those eggs are hatching, and when those nestlings are, are old enough. 
um, to, to be trapped and be brought into the zoo. Uh, one of the pieces of equipment that we use in particular uh, that's really useful for us to try and learn more about these owls, because of course, as the others mentioned, they nest underground. So you can't just look into their nest uh, and see what's going on, is this thing we call a burrow scope uh, or sometimes called a peeper. Um, and this is a, it's a basically a piece of long piece of rock drill hose with a surveillance camera on the end of it. And this is my former coworker, Kelly, uh, using one of these. And she has a pillowcase over her head because you have these sort of goggles with a screen that you use uh, to see what's on the other end of that camera. And it's often very bright in the prairie and you can't see the screen unless it's dark. So that's why uh, she has a pillowcase over her head. To give you an idea of what it looks like when you're running one of these cameras uh, down a, an owl burrow. So here's someone uh, just putting the camera down into the burrow. You can see they have uh, some goggles over their face. And then now this is just what it looks like when we're, we're running a burrow scope down an owl burrow. So there's a, definitely an art to it. You could say um, this tunnel is pretty straight and pretty big and pretty wide open. And you could see an owl just walked away from the camera down there. Um, but as you can imagine, a lot of these, and there's uh, three young owlets right there. Um, as I said, this tunnel is pretty straight. A lot of these tunnels are twisted and turns. There's often forks. So you could go down and you look in one, one fork and you don't know nothing there and you have to bring the camera back and go down another, uh, another tunnel. And so when we're kind of collecting data on these nests, uh, we're often leaving notes for each other to say, you know, go down first turn on the right, go another meter, and then you can get into the nest. And so when we're monitoring these nests, uh, then later in the summer, we can trap at them um, to capture owls, to bring to the zoo, to take some of those youngest ones that otherwise wouldn't survive. Um, and I said, we want to release owls in pairs, in male-female pairs, uh, which is great, uh, except that you can't tell the sex of an owl by looking at them. Um, and so what we actually have to do is catch the owls and take a small blood sample and then use that blood sample uh, to then use the owl's DNA to figure out whether it's male or whether it's female. Really what we're doing, uh, we're using a technique called PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction, that really is testing to see whether or not the owl in question has two copies of the same chromosome, which male owls have XX, or uh, sorry, ZZ, thinking, um, <laughs> and, or whether it's a female owl and she has two copies of two different chromosomes, which would be ZW. Uh, so we use PCR to, to do that. And ultimately what you end up with is some samples run through a piece of agaros gel, and then you either end up with, uh, the test tells you that either an individual has two copies of the same chromosome, and so it's male, or has two different chromosomes, so it's female. Um, and so we have a small setup uh, to do this in our field house. So it takes us about five hours from having a blood sample that we take out of an owl to knowing whether or not it's a male or a female. Um, and so, We've been doing this, as I mentioned, since 2016. Uh, in that time, we've kept 33 pairs of burrowing owls over winter uh, at the zoo and released them all the following spring. Of those 33 pairs we've released, uh, 26 um, had successful nests and fledged young owlets. In total, over those four years, we fledged an additional 152 owlets over those four years with roughly 38 owlets a year. Um, and the other thing that's really exciting is that we found that roughly 8% of the young owls that fledge out of the nests um, from the pairs we release, about 8% of those owls come back uh, the following year. And that 8% is also kind of a minimum estimate because most of those owls that we're able to find coming back are males. Um, we've only had, I think, one female return out of all those. Um, and that's because males have much higher site fidelity. So they're much more likely to come back much closer to the same area. So it's easier for us to find them again. And we have them marked. Um, so there was that question about transmitters. Uh, another way, and I'll talk about those in just a minute, but another way we mark them is with bird bands on their legs. Um, and so it's very, it's a really great way to tell one owl from another, but of course you have to find the owl again out in the prairie and the prairies are big and wide and there's a lot of prairie to search for owls. Um, uh, Alex was mentioning that we use transmitters as well. Uh, so this is an owl with a backpack satellite transmitter uh, on it. It wears the transmitter like a, a little harness backpack. Um, the solar panels charge the battery and the transmitter sends signals uh, up to satellites so that we can then uh, track them. 
we use those both uh, on the owls in the short periods of time, you know, immediately after we've released them, it's really nice to know whether an owl has stayed around or whether or not they've left the area. Uh, sometimes one owl in a pair might die because either a predator got it or something happened. And then in, in several instances where that's occurred, because we have transmitters, we know that the mate has then flown off and paired and, made and nested with some other owl. Uh, so that's really useful. And we can also try and use these transmitters um, to uh, get a better understanding of uh, burrowing owl migration. Um, as I mentioned, of course, unfortunately, uh, we do lose some owls to predators. And sometimes there's an example of a transmitter we found that has tooth marks in it. Um, but even this, we can, you know, helps us to learn more about the threats that burrowing owls are facing. Um, I thought I'd finish by just showing you some photos. We have trail cameras um, at our nest as well. And there's a lot of other wildlife on the prairie as others have mentioned as well. And uh, like, you know, fruginous hawks visiting these nests or prairie falcons, coyotes come by the artificial burrows very regularly, though we have the burrows designed in such a way that, uh, you know, something like a coyote um, or even potentially likely a badger couldn't get into the actual nest chamber because we have a constriction. And I'm always amazed to see these animals interacting with each other as well. If you look at this photo, you can see there's a pair of burrowing owls that we released with a badger walking around in front of them. And they're definitely keeping a close eye on that badger, but it's always amazing to me that they don't, uh, that, that we can get these photos of them there together. Of course, there's lots of other visitors that are nests like pronghorn and plenty of ground squirrels, even skunks and hares. And of course, um, as Alex said, uh, you know, burrowing owl country is beef country and burrowing owls like grazing a lot. Um, and so we work in areas that are regularly grazed by cattle. So of course we have thousands and thousands and thousands of photos of cows. Uh, anyway, in the future, we're getting back out in the field this year and restarting the project to bring 20 owls into the zoo in June and July. And we're also building a new wildlife conservation center uh, in Calgary, or it's outside Calgary, actually. Um, and so we'll be able to uh, have even more owls in our project in years to come. Uh, yeah, so I just want to, yeah, again, thank everybody for listening and say a really big thank you to the landowners that let us uh, work on their land um, and help us and tell us where there are owls. Um, to the donors who support this project and support the Calgary Zoo, we couldn't do this work without those people. Um, and uh, just to all those people who help these projects and are just so passionate and happy to help owls. I love it. So yeah, thank you very much. Awesome. That was wonderful, Graham. I, uh, if you ever need uh, an extra hand, I can come <laughs> help out anytime. This is really, really awesome work you guys are doing. It's fantastic. Um, Ashley, do we have some questions for Graham? We've got a couple minutes here. Yes, we do. Uh, so as usual, we have lots of questions coming in. Um, so yeah, Graham, thank you very much for the talk. I would join Caitlin in helping you out with your... Um, so the first question is, uh, do you find when owls are kept over the winter that it affects their first migration or it's just so instinctive that it doesn't seem to make a difference? That's a great question. Um, so uh, we do, we find that Generally speaking, the burrowing owls that we've held over winter do seem to, the ones that we still have transmitters on, uh, do seem to leave on migration roughly around the same time as, you know, totally, it was like burrowing owls that have not spent any time in captivity. Um, we have had challenges in that while the burrowing owls that we release do really, really well over the breeding season and survival is really high through to the end of July, there's a lot of owls that die um, in the few months between when they're done breeding and when they would start migrating in sort of late September and October. Um, and so of the owls that we've been tracking uh, with transmitters, about three quarters of them uh, die before actually leaving Alberta. Um, so yeah, so they seem to act like normal owls, but uh, um, yeah, not as many make it. Out yeah, Canada, something's going on. Yeah, okay, so. well, thank you very much. Um, Another question is, what do you feed the fledglings as you winter them? Mm. Uh, we give them uh, mice. Uh, so we have a supplier that we get. They're like uh, like dead lab mice, uh, basically, is what they eat mostly. Um, also, in their enclosure at the zoo, um, there's a it's a big oh, there's a big open flight pen, um, and so there's lots of wild prey that can get in there as well, like particularly insects and things. It's you know, it's there's meadows all around it, so. Right on. 
Um, okay, is there a concern that the head started owls that spend time at the zoo might be poor hunters, uh, unafraid of predators or both? So in terms of the predators, uh, another advantage of their um, the flight pen that's outdoors is that while the predators can't get into the area with them, um, there are natural predators that would be flying over all the time. Um, and so they're not totally unexposed, uh, though they don't necessarily have the real threat of them. Um, and in terms of hunting, um, what we do is we continue feeding them after we've released them. And then once they're done in the breeding season, we gradually wean them off the extra food that we give them. So the goal there is to continue supporting them after they've been released into the wild and then sort of gradually introduce them to the reality that they need to, to feed themselves. And we also, um, owls um, spit up pellets um, that's, you know, uh, leftovers from what they've eaten. It's like insect parts and bits of hair and, and bits of bone. And so we can look at their pellets and see what they're eating. And because the lab waste mice we give them are, are all white, like a lab mice you'd imagine, we can then see and you can see bits of other prey. They have many, many pellets full of insects, full of other colors of hair and bits of fur and things like that. So um, it helps us know that they are eating uh, natural prey. Really cool. Thank you. That's great. Cool. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Graham. That was fantastic. Thanks for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, okay. Last but not least, we have Lauren Meads with the Burring Owl Conservation Society of BC. So Lauren, when you're ready, you can share your screen and take it away. Okay, great. Uh, last but not least here. <laughs> Um, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm all the way out on the west coast. Um, not quite on the coast though. Uh, there is some grasslands in British Columbia. So I'm uh, going to talk about the burrowing owls in British Columbia. I'm Lauren Meads. I'm the executive director of the Burrowing Owl Conservation Society and I've been working with the society for about 13 years. So as uh, others have talked about, they are endangered throughout Canada and they've been extirpated from British Columbia since the 1980s. So that means they've been functionally extinct just in this area, but they are found in other parts of Canada. You'll see here, this is sort of an old range map. Um, it's as current as 2004. I think it's even uh, smaller than, than, that, than that now. Um, you can see that their historical range was in the interior grasslands of BC. It's probably actually a little bit bigger than this, um, but this is where some of the sightings were. And this now is kind of where our release sites are. We're kind of in the southern part of BC here and in the Nicola Valley, which is near Kamloops. And you can see they keep declining. <laughs> so the bit of the history of the program. Uh, so Originally in the late 1980s, there was a government initiative by the BC government to release burrowing owls into artificial burrows um, into the grasslands. And they didn't have any burrowing owls of their own. So they actually went over to Washington state and they were able to capture some live owls and bring them up. And back then you could swap species. So uh, British Columbia sent down some bighorn sheep for Washington and we got some burrowing owls. You can't do that anymore. Now it's a lot of permits and it takes a few years. So we've done it a few more times where we've actually gone down to Washington and Oregon, trapped some live owls to bring back up here. However, that program, uh, they did really well out in the field but then they migrated and just didn't come back. So Mike McIntosh, who is our president and founder in the early 1990s, he worked at a zoo and they had burrowing owls there uh, when that zoo shut down. That was actually the Stanley Park Zoo. He said, let's breed burrowing owls in BC to release in BC. And maybe that will be the good thing that will keep them here. So started in 1990, released only about nine owls back then, had one breeding facility uh, that was actually in White Rock on the coast. And then slowly after that, in the mid nineties, um, the BC Wildlife Park in Kamloops built a facility and it's actually our largest facility to date. And then in the year 2000, we became an official society. So that means we could actually be charitable status and collect donations and have a lot more volunteers. 
And so we have volunteers come out and help us with breeding of the owls, releasing the owls. Um, it's really community orientated. And we do a lot of the same stuff um, that Alex and Graham do as well, monitoring the owls, taking all kinds of measurements, um, taking feather samples, blood samples. Like I said, it's huge community involvement here. We have the largest breeding facilities of burrowing owls um, in Canada and probably in North America right now. And it needs a lot of volunteers. We've also dug probably close to a thousand burrows since the early nineties. So there's lots of burrows out there. We actively monitor about 500 to 600 a year. And um, that's, I'm the only full-time staff. And then I have a part-time assistant. And then if we do get some money, we try and get um, a student or hopefully two students um, to help us out. So, you know, we talked about some of the life cycles of the burrowing owls. So um, we just did this this last weekend. So to all of our facilities, we separate the owls. So unlike Graham's, um, the head starting, we actually breed the burrowing owls in our facilities. And then those burrowing owls will actually raise their young. So they're teaching them how to hunt and how to fly and be a burrowing owl. And then their young are the ones that we will release. So right now, um, we usually do it around Valentine's Day, but it was kind of cold that week. So we just did it this last week and we take our founding owls and they generally are owls that have come from Washington, Oregon. Remember they've been extirpated from BC. So we don't really have any wild ones or they're genetically descended from those guys. And we keep track of their genetics um, so that we make sure we, we have a good diverse pool of owls. So we put them into their inner breeder pens and then around the outside of the pens, we have a flyaway and we separate the males and the females. We don't want them to breed before we release them. We want them to breed in the wild. So this is, this is when we've uh, separated them. And then we actually release a little bit earlier than Graham and Alex. We release uh, about third week of April. That is because our owls actually have started migrating back to BC, usually end of March, beginning of April. So they're a little bit sooner and that's only just because BC is a little bit warmer. So um, sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> um, so our founders are together and then at the facility, they're gonna start having eggs around April, incubate those, you know, six to 12 eggs roughly. They hatch April, May, and then July, we ban them. We also take uh, unlike Graham, we, we don't need to know their, their sex right away. So we can actually take feathers. We send them to wildlife genetics in Nelson, BC. They let us know a couple months later, which one is a male and female. So we'll know then. And then these owls that were born will be released next year. So the owls we're releasing this year were born in 2020. The owls born in and this year, 2021 will be released in 2022. And like I said, we've, we've got a large captive breeding population. So we're like, if we're gonna bring the owls back, we need to breed a lot of owls. So generally we release about a hundred owls a year. We'd love to do more of that, but unfortunately we'd have to have big, more facilities. We have three and we wanna have them separate across BC as well. We don't want them all at the same spot. Like we don't want all of our eggs in one basket in case there is a disease or fire. Um, we want to make sure we have those separate facilities. So again, we actually have one at the BC Wildlife Park. We have one now near Langley, uh, Port Kells, and we have one down in the South Okanagan in Oliver. And again, those founders originate from Washington, Oregon. So I talked about, we have close to a thousand boroughs out there, probably five to 600 that we actively monitor. And that's across 14 different sites with private ranchers, which make up our main body. Um, you can see we actually have some of these Operation Burrowing Owl that Saskatchewan gave us a long time ago. So we use that with some of the landowners. Most of the landowners actually don't want to advertise it. And we, we don't really want to advertise it as well um, because we want the owls to make sure they have a quiet place to breed, be as most natural as possible. Um, we're also working with a lot of other groups, Nature Conservancy of Canada, Nature Trust of BC, and we're really excited is two local uh, bands, the Upper Nicola Band and the Penticton Indian Band 
have um, collaborated with us as well. We dig the burrows, we provide the owls and the band members are the ones monitoring the owls. So we work quite closely with them. We also have a, a federal site, hopefully, and uh, some provincial sites. And as you can see there, there's some cattle there. Our burrows are cattle proof in the sense they will not harm the cattle, which is number one. Unfortunately, sometimes the cattle wreck our burrows, so that can be unfortunate. And actually up on this hill here, there's uh, probably about six burrows, but you can't see them at all. And so we want to make it visible for the owls, but not visible to people passing by. Again, burrow installation. We don't dig them with machines because a lot of times we're on private property and it can sometimes be hard to access these areas. So that's where we rely on volunteers. And it can be really rocky here in BC. So it's a bit of hard work. These are about four feet deep. And again, uh, 10 feet long, either big O pipe or whatever you want to call it, or weeping tile. And again, it's very similar to a lot of the other ones. Uh, somebody had talked about recycled stuff. So uh, we used to use old plastic white buckets from uh, gas companies. So like old, like uh, garages and stuff like that. Unfortunately, those degraded really, really quickly. So we end up using these black plastic ones and we do get them sort of at wholesale price because obviously we've put in a lot, but that uh, typically a burrow installation is about $50. That's not including labor. Um, so the release techniques, actually the soft release caging that we now all use across BC was developed by Amy Mitchell. And she did that, um, it was her masters and she did that here in BC. So she developed this cage and it's actually four by four by four. Um, Alex is able to use a bigger one. We would want to use bigger ones, but we tend to deploy about 40 to 50 cages uh, a season. So that many, um, it's, it just is too much storage for us. Also, sometimes we have to walk a kilometer to a burrow site. So we want it a bit lighter as well. And these kind of set up like a tent. When we release the owls, we release them as pairs. And uh, basically they don't decide, we decide for them. We don't want siblings together. So we pair them up, we stick them in there and that's where they're, we're still gonna feed them in there. And they're gonna be in there until they start laying a nest or at least preparing a nest because that makes them more likely to stay. Before the soft release cages, we used to just do hard release. So just putting them in a burrow and hoping they stay. Some of them did, but a lot of them either would die from predators because they weren't used to it, um, or they just were not bonded to that site. Um, they had no reason to be at that burrow site, so they would leave. This actually increases their chance of survivability and able to nest. Um, and again, watch for those predators. Um, our cages, our breeder cages um, at our facilities are also open air, so they get a chance to see those predators too. From Amy's work in 2005 and 2006, you can see that the hard release, so the ones where you no cage there, compared to the soft release, so the caging there, it um, all stages of breeding increase survivability of the owls. And especially for these pairs of owls, initiated clutch, hatching chicks, and actually having fledged. So pretty much 50% across the board. So if we're gonna release these owls, if we put in all this energy into um, growing an owl <laughs> at one of our facilities, we want to make sure that they get out there and have the best chance possible. Um, in other birds of prey release strategies, it's actually called hacking. So if you know what that means, it's the same thing as a soft release cage. And again, so before 2005, we used, um, we did not use the cages. And then after 2005, we started using cages. So you can see that the dramatic increase and in how many young are produced in the wild. And this is wild juveniles hatched per owl we've released and owls we've that have come back from migration. Um, this is one of our releases. Everybody's always like, I wanna come to a release. I wanna come to a release. Well, this is what happens. We stick them in a hole and that's it. So I tell people, if you want to help out, it's actually better if you come and dig a burrow and then I will invite you when it's not COVID to come out and band the young because that's a bit more fun. Um, we also sometimes put an electric fence around our cages. And um, yeah, is this one? Yep, this one's working. <laughs> so we put that electric fence around 
to prevent cattle coming and knocking over those cages. So um, this just gives a little shock. Uh, I don't know why these two volunteers really like to test them just to see if uh, they're working. Um, but they are working and they keep the cattle away from the cages because out when you're in the prairie, these cattle want to rub up against something. And when they see a cage, they just want to rub up against it. So that just prevents them from doing that. So supplemental feeding, uh, Lori talked about when the owls want to attract a mate, they do a food cache. So this is typically what they would food cache. So pocket gophers, metal voles, um, it kind of can range like the types of rodents through North America, what they will collect. Um, but this is typical of them. Of course, if we're releasing captive ones, they don't have that right away. So we feed them mice. Um, and we feed the same thing at our facilities, mice. We also feed Dale chicks because it's a little cheaper um, because we're feeding three facilities and they can have um, between five to 10 pairs of owls. And then they have on average about eight young each. So you can imagine like for the, our three facilities, that's our major cost. Um, so the mice are almost a dollar each, whereas the chicks are about 10 cents. And again, like with um, Graham, is we support them quite a bit once they're first released, and then we sort of taper it off um, as they've had young and um, going towards uh, migration because we want them to start really getting enough energy from wild prey as possible. And so that when they migrate, they hopefully will be able to maintain themselves as they go down there. Um, so we talked about, uh, Graham talked about, he will be taking some of the last ones to hatch. Oh, do I have not much time? <laughs> Just a couple more minutes and we'll, okay. we'll get to a couple questions then. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the last ones to hatch. So that's our, our education owls as well come from that. So this is uh, cut up mice and we feed that to the last ones to hatch. We also have bands. We have a green over black and for migration, these are all of our sightings of our owls just from the band numbers since the early 90s. So this is where we've got most of our data. And again, the transmitters that Graham was talking about, we haven't actually put any in our birds, but we did test a prototype on our facility. Um, and then we realized we needed this little lift kit here um, so that the solar panel um, can be above the feathers. And then this is some of data, like they're just kind of going all over. And again, uh, wild born owls, quite a few. Um, this is our released owls. So we continue to release quite a bit. Our returns are not so great. And this is really the crux of the issue right now is that all of the programs are really good at having the owls breed here in the summer. It's that they migrate and they're not able to return. Um, Caitlin wanted me to touch on the differences with the BC owls. Well, We've, uh, a lot of us in Canada have contributed to the bird genoscape project and they are looking at the genes within the burrowing owls and they're finding that actually all of the Canadian ones and all the, all the migratory burrowing owls are pretty much the same. There are genetic differences at some of the resident populations in Southern California and the Southern United States, but pretty much our Canadian ones are very closely related um, to each other. So there, we used to think that the Rockies, there would be a divide and they were very different, but in fact, they're getting closer together. They're still working on some of the data from this, but we're hoping to get some more information and that might help us, um, you know, help save these birds across Canada. And I don't have my education owl with me. He's at our facility right now, but I just thought you guys might wanna see, this is Pluto. And he's all puffed up because it's a little chilly there. And this is one of this is his burrow that he has, and he has his own giant pen there. And again, like the others, he has not been out to many presentations this last year. So um, usually we do take him to quite a few around BC. So that's him there. <laughs> and just want to say thank you to all the landowners, ranchers, volunteers, and also Burring Owl Winery. Drink, our, drink their wine. They actually help us <laughs> quite a bit. And this is our website. And if you want to donate, um, please feel free to do that. And uh, thank you very much, Caitlin and the whole team in Nature Saskatchewan. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. That was wonderful. Um, Ashley, do we have, uh, we're just a couple minutes over our time, but let's take a few minutes, extra minutes here and um, have any questions for Lauren. 
Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much for the presentation, Lauren. I'll just ask you a couple of questions here. Um, so you mentioned that you uh, do blood samples like they do at the Calgary Zoo. There's a question about how do you get the blood samples? Can you do this when the owls are in the burrow or do you have to get the owls out of the burrow and how do you do that? Yeah. So we actually, the last five years, we haven't had to do the blood sampling, but we used to do it. So there's actually, a, we would take the owls out of the burrows and we just do it at our, our facility, so we don't have to do it in the field like Graham does, but we're taking, um, they have a main artery in their wing there, and you just do a tiny little pinprick. You don't need much blood, just a couple little drops there. Um, we, because we're doing close to 100 owls, that's a lot of blood. Um, so we've actually, we were able to come up with a method with Wildlife Genetics and Nelson to just take a couple little fluffy feathers, so not their flight feathers, but fluffy ones, and we send that to them. And then a couple months later, they let us know if male or female, and it's pretty much 100% accurate. So it's a little bit kinder for them and for me too. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Thank you. Um, and I'll just ask one more question. So to Lauren, how is it that the cattle have wrecked the burrows? And are there any solutions that you found to prevent the cattle from wrecking artificial burrows? <laughs> Yeah, so sometimes because the way the tunnel comes up at the entrance, sometimes the cattle will step and crush the entrance of the burrow. So we sometimes put rocks and things around um, to, to protect that. Unfortunately, the cattle will knock those rocks off. Um, we, <laughs> we've done all kinds of things to deter the cattle, like putting salt blocks, but a little bit further away from our burrows. So they'll go over there. Unfortunately, we just kind of have to repair them. And that's the thing with artificial burrows, even though they're great, they require a lot of maintenance. We would love it if um, burrowing mammals would kind of come back and take over that because we're constantly having to visit them and repair them if there's cattle damage or rodent damage or what, all kinds of things. So, yeah. So thank you very much. Okay. All right. So thank you so much, Lauren, for being here. Um, we really appreciate it and good luck with uh, your programming and enjoy the warm weather over there. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's been about seven, eight degrees. I'm sorry, everybody. It's oh, got, yeah. It yeah, was yeah. cold last week, but now it's nice. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Take Thank care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, with that, um, this concludes um, our Burrowing Owl webinar, um, all about Burrowing Owl webinar for tonight. So once again, um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening and thank you so much to our speakers for taking the time um, to be here with us tonight. That's it. I wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening and good night.